Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, I see people are still trickling into the call. So if you can hear us and you're just joining, welcome to, oh, yep, here, more coming already. <laughs> uh, welcome to another event here in our virtual unabridged space. Um, tonight, we are very, very excited to have with us John D'Amelio, um, Owen Keenan, um, to celebrate the release of Queer Legacies. Um, the book technically is out next week, so if you have um, pre-ordered a copy um, in joining for the event tonight, you'll be getting an email from us soon once we have those available. Um, and tonight we are very excited to hear from the author and hear some questions about his process for researching and writing this. We're also very excited to be doing this in partnership with Gerber Hart Library and Archive. Um, you're going to hear some more about them and the important work that they do um, in just a minute. Just a few words about how our Zoom events are working. Um, you will notice that you are muted right now, but like in a live event, you still can be seen on screen. If you have a question, please drop that into the chat and a little bit later into our presentation when we have some time, we'll share those with the authors to answer your questions. Um, so yeah, help me join uh, in welcoming John and Owen. Um, just a quick bio for those guys, John, has been a uh, professor of history and gender and women's studies at University of Illinois at Chicago and is the current president of the board at Gerber Hart Library and Archives. So he knows what he's talking about in writing this book. Um, his previous books include Sexual Politics, Sexual Communities, and Intimate Matters. Um, and we're very excited to have him here tonight to help us celebrate this book. Um, our own Owen Keenan is a grassroots historian who we are just blessed to have in the store with us here. He's also the author of several books. His most recent was Dugan's Bistro and The Legend of the Bearded Lady. Um, he's a co-founder of the Legacy Project, which is a history and education organization that focuses on reclaiming and celebrating the LGBTQ past. Um, so we're very excited to have both of them here to talk about Chicago, LGBTQ history, and Gerber Hart Library. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Jen, who's gonna tell us about the library and what they do. Thanks, Matt. Um, I'm Jen Dentel from Gerber Hart Library and Archives. Um, we are an LGBTQ library and archives located up in Rogers Park. We've been around since 1981 and we have a really large circulating library as well as an archive, an archives that has over 150 different archival collections. So if you're around in Chicago, please stop by and visit us. If you wanna check out a book, learn more about Chicago's LGBTQ history, if you read John's book and you see something you wanna learn more about, you can stop by and check out the collection that it came from. Um, so I'm really excited to read the book personally um, and I'm turning it back over to John now. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you, Matt, for uh, arranging all of this. Uh, what I thought I would do is just for a few minutes, uh, give you some background on the book, like how it came together. Um, it, it started really as a series of blog posts for uh, a, a website called Out History. And my goal in doing it is that I wanted to demystify for people the process of historical research and, and let people see how exciting and surprising and uh, amazing it can be as you do research in an archive to discover things that you weren't suspecting. And after a few of uh, those blog posts, uh, I began to realize that, oh my God, this could be a book. And the way it was organized is I would go to the Gerber Hart Library and I would pick an individual collection. Uh, the first one that I worked on were the papers of Melissa Ann Mary, who was a bisexual activist in Chicago. And reading through the collection immediately, it's like I was like astounded by the explosion of bisexual activism that occurred in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And you could see from the, from the materials that she had that what motivated it was the way that bisexuals were being targeted by the mainstream press uh, as responsible for the spread of AIDS into what the press referred to as, quote, the general population. Uh, well, anyway, uh, you know, I wrote about her and I wrote about a few others. And then at a certain point, I said, I'm just going to put all of these things together and create a book. And so what you have here 
uh, are 38 essays, each of which can stand on its own based on a different collection at the Gerber Hart Library. Some of them are biographical portraits of individuals that most of us have probably never heard of, but their lives are so interesting and inspiring. Uh, some of the chapters are about the work of organizations, uh, activist organizations, uh, cultural organizations like the Artemis Singers, uh, recreational organizations like Front Runners and things like that. Uh, some are about events and campaigns that were really important in the history of LGBTQ Chicago. Um, and, you know, taken all together, I think as you read them, you will learn a lot about uh, the history of Chicago and maybe even the larger LGBTQ movement from the 60s forward. And I'm hoping you, more of you also think, oh my God, research could be so much fun. I think I'll spend my afternoon or my evening doing this. Um, so I think I'll stop here uh, and turn it over to Owen and he and I can begin a conversation um, about the book. Hello everybody. Uh, my name is Owen Keenan and uh, John, I loved your book. Well, thank uh, you. There's so many fascinating things about it. Um, and one of the interesting things, you talk about sort of just choosing these different archival collections, but you have, as you said, such a broad range of, of topics and types of groups and everything else. Did you have any criterion when you were sort of looking through a box about what would make a good essay or one you uh, wanted to include? I, I picked things that either I didn't know anything about mm -hmm. uh, or I wanted to know more about. Um, as, as kind of one example, uh, I, I knew that Dignity, uh, an organization of LGBTQ Catholics, had existed since the beginning of the 1970s uh, and has had done a lot of work. But, but mostly, you know, you tend, apropos of the Pope's recent statement, mostly we tend to think of the Catholic Church as being very anti-gay. Um, and so I thought, well, let me learn more about what the actual work that Dignity did. And the story was completely fascinating. I mean, one, one piece of it uh, was that in the early 70s in Chicago, something existed that was called the Gay Mass, where a priest in the Chicago Archdiocese said Mass to a gathering every other week of LGBT people. Um, and after a year or so, the Cardinal even allowed those masses to be held in a church. Who knew that this was happening, right? Uh, so that's, I, you know, I went to collections where I thought, oh, this could be interesting, or I don't know anything about this. Well, that's fun. <laughs> I, I am so there with you on the excitement of doing this. In fact, when you were talking about the gay mass, one of the things I got very excited about in the book was the first mass happened at 642 Aldine. So I was like, I'm gonna go check out that address. Uh -huh. um, so it has, it has a really fun interaction to go through, um, through this history as well. Right. And I was wondering, as you were writing it and compiling these, if you had any sort of target audience in mind. Well, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm two di well, maybe two different kinds of audiences. One is because these are all short essays rather than you know, a book of 300 pages where you start at page one and you have to go through to the end, but you can read any five or six pages you want. It occurred to me that a book like this in a storytelling mode could be very appealing to students, uh, even high school as well as college students because it allows them to learn pieces of LGBTQ history um, and you know, one piece at a time. And in the way that I was exploring interesting collections, they can look at the titles and decide which topics they want. Uh, but I think it's also uh, a book that is, could be, should be appealing to a general LGBTQ audience because so much has changed in the last 50 years. And uh, those of us who are older 
can forget all of the things that happened to make this possible. And those of us who are younger, you know, don't learn about this. So um, here's an opportunity to sort of delve into the experience of the world that you're a part of that has made a difference in terms of how we live our lives today. Um, one, of the, one of the themes that really comes through uh, in these essays is the theme of coming out and the theme of visibility. Mm -hmm. And I found it really fascinating how you handle it in that you don't just talk about visibility of the gay community. You talk about the visibility of all the communities under that umbrella. So you're, you discuss the visibility of the lesbian community, the visibility of the, the Black and Latinx community, the visibility of the bisexual and trans communities. I was wondering if you could uh, just speak briefly about that um, need for visibility of groups within the group. Sure. Um, well, first of all, to address the issue of visibility, you know, just as a little piece of history, um, after the Stonewall Uprising in New York City, which launches what then was called the Gay Liberation Group, the first publication that these new radical activists started putting out, the title of it, the name of the magazine was Come Out with an exclamation point because there was the sense that unless we take the risk of showing ourselves, of revealing who we are and not living in secret, change is not going to happen. And that has remained true you know, over the decades, uh, the need for people to keep coming out in different ways and in different circumstances. Um, but one of the things that was exciting about doing the Gerber, the research at Gerber Park and looking through these different kinds of collections is that you can see that process being worked through for different groups within the larger population. Uh, one of the collections at Gerber Park that is so rich with material uh, and you know, it was rich enough that it was very easy to write two chapters about it, are the papers of Amigas Latinas, uh, which uh, an organization of uh, Latinx women that was started in 1995 in Chicago at a time when even though there is a visible gay and lesbian community, uh, Latinx women are kind of marginalized and not seen in the major organizations and the like. And the founders of the organization, people like Mona Noriega and Yvette Cardona, <laughs> created an environment in which women loving women could come together and not only have a safe space, but in time begin to assert themselves both in the LGBT community and also in the Latinx community. So, um, it's, and, it's, and that has made a difference. Um, I could, you could see the same kind of process at work in the uh, papers of people like uh, Ken Allen and Wendell Reed, African-American men. Uh, and one of the things that their papers reveal is the amount of organizing that was done at the community level to educate African-Americans about AIDS in the 1980s and 1990s. So, uh, you know, we need all of this uh, in order to get a full and varied and complete picture of who we are as a people. Um, one of the, the uh, things too that I like about these essays is that a lot of them um, are basically a call to action. Um, in that I look at something like your covering of the, uh, the essay about Robin Dupree and how that essay would not have existed, how that could not have existed if someone hadn't taken it upon themselves mm -hmm. to interview her. So I was wondering if you could speak a little about maybe Robin and the need to, um, to uh, chronicle our history. Okay, good, yes. So um, Robin Dupree, uh, by using her own language, was uh, a female impersonator for probably, she performed for probably 
more than 40 years. Uh, as a teenager, uh, African-American, uh, growing up on the South Side, uh, she, as a teenager, she discovered uh, Jim Flint's bar, the Baton, where there were drag performers in the 1960s. And Robin realized, oh my God, this is who I am. Okay. And so she performs, you know, in Chicago, and then she moves uh, to Kentucky, Indiana, and is just performing for decades. Well, uh, in the 1990s, uh, when she was living in Kentucky, a professor uh, at one of the branches of the University of Kentucky who was teaching uh, a class on the history, on popular culture and history, uh, brought his class to see a performance of Robin Dupre. And one of the students in that master's program got so excited by what she saw that she said, can I write my master's essay on this? And, uh, and in order to do that, she did an extensive oral history of Robin so that we have a really detailed version of her life. And thank heavens, uh, the student uh, donated both her master's essay and the, a transcript of the interview to the Gerber Hart Library. You know, without that, no one else would know about this amazingly inspirational life. I mean, she, she in her own words, was the mother to two or three generations of younger trans women who were rejected by their families and needed the support of someone. So yeah, uh, it, it was very exciting. That, and that was a good example of, oh my God, we would never know this if we weren't making an effort to archive our community's history. Well, and I love that you end that essay with, um, I think it ends with the sentence, now go out and interview someone. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, and yes. another call All to you, action. go out and interview someone. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, another um, essay that I found so incredible was, I don't want to mispronounce her name, but it was uh, Jenny, is it Soule or Soul? I'm not sure the pronunciation. It's uh, S-O-U-L-E. I think, I think it's Soul. I'm not sure either because I never knew her. But anyway, years ago, uh, Jenny did a lesbian history calendar. Mm -hmm. And as I was reading, and it became very popular. And as I was reading that, I thought, you know, that's, that's a really good idea for a student to do. And so going back to what you mentioned earlier, did you have like this sort of jumping point in mind when, uh, when doing the book about the uh, LGBTQ inclusive curriculum coming up? Well, no, yes. I mean, I because I started the research around the just around the time that the law was being when the law was being seriously debated and and it looked like it was going to pass. And I thought, oh wow, uh, we need as many different kinds of resources as possible when curriculum inclusion becomes the mandate. And as I said earlier, uh, especially, you know, being realistic, you know, in terms of what students are going to read, uh, 300 pages, that would be a lot. But uh, 20 pages of four different five page essays, mm -hmm. that could be very revealing and and leave them better informed than before they started. Um Going along with that, did you have any idea of how a lesson plan, if you were to do a lesson plan of this book? <laughs> Too um, much? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, another thing that I love about this book too is you cover so many things that, uh, that are just, that, that I had not heard of. I, I'm talking specifically now about the Transgender Legal Committee and the transvest, uh, Transvestite Information Service, which were both came, happened around 1971. So if you could address that, I'm curious what issues were the main issues in the trans community in 1971? Well, the, the, these are two essays. One is about an organization that was Chicago-based called uh, the Trans... Uh, uh, transvestite, it's, yeah, the Transvestite Legal Committee. Okay. Uh, 
And uh, because that was the word that was used in the early 70s, transgender hadn't been invented yet as a word. Uh, So the Transvestite Legal Committee was Chicago based. The Transvestite Information Service was uh, like a very large pen pal club that existed nationwide. And I'll explain now a little bit about each of them since they're separate essays. and this again is apropos of the current moment. It's a, an example of how history is very relevant to the world that we live in now. The Transvestite Legal Committee was formed at the end of 1970 after the Chicago police shot in the back and killed an unarmed trans woman. Now, Given the times, we only know the birth name of that individual, who was James Clay. Uh, but the, the horribleness of this unprovoked police murder of an individual provoked a group of trans women in Chicago, uh, almost all of whom were women of color, African American, to form an organization that would both, that would provide trans people in the city with support. One of the things they did was to offer legal advice on how you change your name and your legal documents. Another thing they did, and it's important for us to know this about our history, is that many gay bars uh, would not allow trans women into the bar. Uh, And so the Transvestite Legal Committee organized protest, public protests and demonstrations outside of bars that had exclusionary policies. So it's very important to sort of realize, wow, 50 years ago, the police violence was there and trans people were organizing. The Transvestite Information Service, this was one of the most surprising things I discovered in all the work I did at it, of research. Uh, In a small town in North Carolina, uh, there was a man who was married, uh, but thought of himself as a woman and loved to dress in female clothes. And uh, this individual realized that there must be others like me. And he started producing a newsletter, mailing it out to people that he knew like himself um, and, and the network just grew and grew and grew until there really were, uh, and the language that they use was transvestite cross-dressing and the like, uh, there were transvestites and cross-dressers, uh, living in heterosexual marriages, uh, throughout the United States in big cities and small towns, um, and in the first half of the 70s, there was a national network. Uh, they published a newsletter where wives told the story of what it was like to discover this about their husband and how they've adapted to it. And oh, it's just, it's so fascinating, so interesting. Um, well, this is a good example too of a, a, how many of the essays aren't specifically Chicago based, but Chicago is definitely the key player in the book. And I Mm -hmm. love seeing that. Mm -hmm. Um, So often with LGBTQ history, we've been, um, you know, we hear about New York, LA and San Francisco. Right. And Chicago is sort of not quite as, um, not quite as documented. But it's an exciting time to research Chicago LGBTQ history because of that. Anyway, I was wondering if you have any sort of theories or thoughts as to why Chicago kind of lagged behind in that category or wasn't considered as important. Yeah, I, and I think it's, it's, it's not just about LGBT, but it's this larger flyover phenomenon that people talk about, that the, the two coasts relate to each other. But in terms of LGBT, uh, Q, I mean, one of the reasons, like, for instance, that New York has so has gotten so much more attention and there's been so much more written about it uh, is because, especially in the, you know, the pre-web era, uh, New York was the media capital of the United States. 
Uh, and, and so stories about New York were always much more documented. Uh, and one of the best examples of how New York has taken over our understanding is that, you know, we think of the Stonewall riots and rebellion as the first such, you know, riot in LGBT history, but there were others that came earlier than that, you know, that there was, there were demonstrations uh, outside a bar and, and restaurant in Philadelphia and in San Francisco and, uh, and other places. Um, San Francisco figures so importantly because it developed a reputation in the 60s, especially as sort of counterculture, non-normative. Uh, and, and so in fact, there is objectively a disproportionately large queer community in San Francisco. And so it has many of the people in that community become the writers of its history. But Chicago has so much to tell us. I mean, uh, the vibrancy of these stories like the transvestite legal committee or the gay mass occurring in the early uh, 70s. Also, it's very interesting how many important national conferences were held in Chicago. So activists from around the United States coming here to have experiences that were life-changing and movement-changing for them. So more and more Chicago needs to be written. Another, uh, another um, theme that comes up a few times in the book is your quote about AIDS changed everything. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could address that a little bit. Yes, um, it's, a, it's a phrase that I often used in teaching my undergraduate courses on LGBTQ history and activism. Um, and, and, and the way I would describe it is this, you know, we think again, Stonewall, which gets commemorated every year in pride marches, uh, we think about it as this revolutionary moment and it was really a key moment. But by the end of the seventies, the overwhelming majority of LGBTQ people are still living in the closet. They have not come out. Uh, because the oppression is too large. Uh, one of the essays in the book talks about police raids in 1979 in Chicago, 10 years after Stonewall, that the police, the Chicago police went on a rampage, uh, raiding gay bars and arresting people, uh, and, you know, for, they did it for months. AIDS, uh, because AIDS proved to be a life and death issue, much more than notions of, oh, sexual freedom, I need to tell everybody I'm gay. Uh, because of the AIDS epidemic, that brought masses of people out of the closet and not just gay men. I mean, it is, it's one of the extraordinary aspects of the AIDS epidemic. Uh, is the way in which lesbians rose to the occasion and worked, you know, used the insights they had from feminist health organizing in the 70s to create a response to AIDS. Anyway, by the time, by the end of the 80s, and you can see this in like the work that Black, uh, Black and White Men Together did around AIDS organizing, uh, you can see that so many more people are out of the closet. So many more are engaged in political activism because you needed policy responses from the government in order to you know, deal with the epidemic. That by, you know, it's, I'm not claiming that oppression ends, so that would be ridiculous, but the difference by the mid 1990s it is a dramatically different world than existed at the end of the 1970s. And AIDS is, and the response, well not AIDS, the response to AIDS is largely responsible for that. Um, something I'm curious about as uh, talking about these, all these essays being based upon a collection. In the era of digital technology with emails and phone photos and all this stuff, do you have any concern that all this stuff 
exists in cyberspace, but not as tangible objects? Well, let me say, well, I'll say about that. First of all, I'm probably the wrong person to be asking that question <laughs> to because I'm, I'm a little backward in the realm of technology. But it is also <laughs> true <laughs> that archives, um, especially the archives, you know, that are, are better funded and have, you know, more personnel and, and skill and stuff like that, they're making an effort to collect this material. So uh, it's, it's not just paper uh, that's being collected uh, anymore, but it's flash drives, <laughs> you know, uh, that have everything that was on someone's computer and things like that. And making use of, the, you know, downloading from the cloud and saving that for future generations. And I have to admit, I have not really done my research that way yet. So the next generation will be the leaders in this. Okay. Well, I have more questions I could keep asking you, but I was wondering if anyone uh, who's watching us tonight has anything they'd like to ask. We do have a question from Yvonne. Um, Yvonne asks, what is the most surprising or unexpected piece of history that you dug up in your research? And while we're talking about that, if anybody does have questions they'd like to ask, go ahead and pop those in the chat. Well, I think one of them is, is I've already talked about, which is the material about uh, Catholics. And partly, the, and that really shows the kind of the personal relationship. I grew up Catholic. Uh, but it, for me personally, part of the process of coming out and accepting myself as gay meant leaving the Catholic Church behind. And I tended to see the Catholic Church from that vantage point as being unremittingly hostile. And then in 1986, people may or may not know this, uh, one of the cardinals based in the Vatican, Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, who later became Pope, issued uh, officially this major document about homosexuality that was so, so homophobic and so negative. It was completely uncompromising. Well, that fact erased in my mind the possibility that there could have been any other kind of experience within the Catholic Church. And so to discover what Dignity was doing, not only in Chicago, but in communities around the country and the dialogue that they were creating with Catholic officials, it, was, it made me understand why Ratzinger had to issue that letter in 1986, because change was really rising from below uh, in, in the Roman Catholic Church at least throughout the United States. So I would say that was, um, that, that was pretty surprising, yeah. Thank you for that question, Yvonne. Um, we have another in from IASWG account that asks, wondering what you learned about race, racism, segregation, and LGBTQ communities in Chicago? Well, one of the things that emerges um, is the way in which within the LGBT community, there was overt discrimination. Uh, it's most clearly documented against African Americans and uh, trans women, uh, but that, I'm not saying that's the only ways in which it happened, uh, but uh, it, it comes, you know, it comes out in the fact that one of the major forms of activism in the first half of the 70s, both by, not only by the transvestite legal committee, but also by other activist groups, was to protest the policies that many gay bars had of what they called double and triple carding people of color who were trying to come to the bar. And it was, you know, like how many people are gonna have three different forms of picture ID with them that confirm what their birth date is. And so it became a way of formally excluding people. So, so discri racial discrimination is not something that quote other people do out there. It was happening within the community and within Chicago. And it is, 
it's powerful that some activists uh, fought back against it. Um, the, uh, I also mentioned earlier uh, the papers of Amigas Latinas, which provide a really extensive, uh, 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 extensive information. One of the things that comes through very clearly in, in their papers is that um, the issue of immigration uh, and given that the vast majority of the immigrants to the United States in the last three decades have been people of color who have also then faced all forms of exclusion, uh, Amigas Latinas did a lot to raise the issue of immigration within the LGBT community as an issue that's our issue too. It's not just an issue of quote, those immigrants over there. So that's another example of where uh, racism was embedded in how uh, many white people, especially in the community, thought about what queer issues might be. Thank you for that question. Um, I'd like to open up a question real quick. Um, I see that we have some other hands raised. If you would, wouldn't mind propping those in the chat real quick, we'll try to get those in. But I'd like to ask, um, John and Owen, maybe you can weigh in on this too in regard to um, the Legacy Project. And then Jen, also, if you have some thoughts, um, I'm curious what your advice might be to people that are looking for ways to support or participate in this kind of research and, and especially for Gerber Hart, how people can get involved. Uh, well, one way that you can be a support is, you know, I don't know who you are, I can't see you all, and I don't know your life stories, but uh, Gerber Hart wants collections of material. You know, our archive needs to be an ever-growing archive, and don't think the people you know or the work you're involved in might be not important enough because that's simply not true. So if you've been involved with an organization, uh, if you have personal papers that you're wanting to get rid of that somehow will be revealing of LGBTQ life, uh, really think about donating them to Gerber Hart. Or if you know people uh, who might have such materials, really encourage them uh, to do it. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is, um, especially for those of you who are watching who are in the Chicago area, I know with the pandemic, we're dealing with all sorts of shutdowns and things like that. But Gerber Hart, even in the pandemic, is being very careful about limiting the number of people who will come. Uh, but is as when things loosen up, it's you can go there and spend the afternoon and come back come home so much wiser about our history. And you spend three hours there and there are old periodicals, old magazines, uh, flyers, photographs that you can look at that will teach you so much that you don't know. Owen? Uh, well, going, going along with the book, I also think it's, this book is wonderful because it, offers so much for further research. I mean, there's such a wider range of topics that it really opens the door on, um, on anything you might be interested in or, or a number of things that, that might find, you know, find, be of greater interest. And a lot of it for, um, I think for people is just going with what you wanna research. Gay, LGBTQ history doesn't have to be this big, block of knowledge that you have to swallow whole. I mean, you can just, just research what you want, what you find interesting, what might be fun, what might you know, tickle your fancy for whatever reason. And it, it snowballs because once you start researching things, you realize you know, the sacrifices, you realize the life behind the story, the sort of people behind whatever you're, you're researching. And once you gain that appreciation for things, I, I think it changes the way you view history. You have a bigger allegiance to making sure that this kind of thing doesn't disappear because of something, God forbid, the Supreme Court says, and now you know we're this way. But that uh, 
this is our community. It gives it to me, it, the research itself gives me a real sense of pride. And that's, I mean, I think everybody can reach that place. So that's just, that's my advice is, <laughs> is reach your obsession point. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I mean, similar to what Owen said, I think it's those personal stories and it's, you know, finding someone, a photo of someone just spending time with their friends in the 70s. I mean, that, you know, for me, I, I started volunteering at Gerber Hart, I think about seven years ago. Uh, and first day was building shelves in the archives. Um, <laughs> but the, the second week I was in, I got to go through some photos of um, a person named Tilly, the dirty old lady of Chicago. Uh, who was a drag performer, um, and we got a donation that was photos of her going back to the 1940s. And it was just incredible. I mean, just spending hours going through photos, putting them in acid-free paper, but seeing these memories, um, it was really special. So I think having that personal connection to history, you know, if, you have, if you're in Chicago and you want to volunteer, it's a great way to learn more about our history and also get to see some really cool things, go through boxes, um, there's there's a lot there, and I think you know more people should know these names that are inside the archives. These names should be, hopefully, the change in curriculum will make it happen. But there's incredible stories there, and lots of volunteer opportunities too. That's fantastic. Thank you, guys. Um, we've had just a couple more questions dropped in here. Um, I think we touched on this one a little bit, but maybe. John and Owen, you could weigh in and say uh, what distinguishes Chicago LGBTQ history from New York or San Francisco? Hmm, okay, um, well, one of the things I would say about that is that uh, it's not so much distinguishing them from each other, but in, in learning about Chicago's history in greater depth, you realize that it isn't all about New York and San Francisco. And New York and San Francisco weren't the pioneers of everything. And I'll give you one very good example, which uh, there's an essay about this in the book. Uh, and that's the story of Rene Hanover, who uh, was a Chicago-based lesbian lawyer. Uh, she uh, went to she had been married. She came from a left-wing family. She had been married. She came out in the early 60s. She had a partner. Uh, it was discovered that they were gay. The partner committed suicide. Uh, Rini was expelled from law school. Uh, she got back in. She got her degree. And, you know, Lambda Legal is presented as the beginnings of legal activism in the United States, that it was founded in New York in 1973. Well, for a handful of years before Lambda Legal was founded, Rene Hanover in Chicago was taking on, often pro bono, uh, cases of people who had been arrested, entrapped by the police, uh, she developed amazingly creative ways of winning those cases. Um, she was also visible in the National Lawyers Guild before any, she knew any other LGBT lawyers. So I think part of what's exciting about learning Chicago history is to realize, wow, look at the things that have happened here that were vital and uh, original and you know, on the frontier, the cutting edge of what needed to be done. Uh, I would add to that maybe only that for me, Chicago always had kind of a, when I study Chicago LGBTQ history, I always get, there's a much more of sort of a working class feel I sometimes get than maybe when I read about history that is in Chicago. And the thing I love about Chicago is we have this pantheon of heroes. I mean, there are so many incredible people who fought for LGBTQ rights in this city. And the thing that I think Chicago is so blessed about is that these people didn't get a certain sense of fame or success and then go to New York and go to LA and go to San Francisco, they stayed and tried to make better things that um, 
things that affected the Midwest and you know the area they knew. And so many, like you mentioned, uh, uh, Rini Hanover is just one name. I mean, you talk about a Chuck Renslow, a Renita Gray, a, a Jim Flint, um, James Darby, who you write an essay about in the book, uh, Peg Gray, who you write an essay about in the book too. There's so many people who did so much and they do it out of this passion for community. And it's, it's to me, it was just, it's always a really beautiful thing to find that in research. Right, right. Uh, thank you again for that question, Clara. I think our next question is a good one to help us wrap up tonight. This comes from Mike. Mike asks, John and Owen, how and when and why did you become a historian? Um, well, um, in my case, um, I was a college student in the second half of the 60s, uh, came from a conservative Catholic family and all of a sudden found myself in the middle of this huge anti-war and student movement. And the year I graduated from college, I was working, I had a job in a library and I read a book called The Great Evasion by a historian from Madison, William Appleman Williams. And he transformed how I had never taken a US history course in college. You know, why? Uh, and I read this book and I thought, oh my God, if I want to be an activist who makes change, I need to understand American history and let other people know about it in a way that no one has ever told me before. And so I went to graduate school in history and while I was there, my life intersected with the gay liberation movement and a group of other people who said, we need to do gay and lesbian history to make change. And I was won over and have been doing it ever since. So, Owen? Uh, I would say mine probably, the biggest factor was um, the AIDS epidemic. And a lot of that came from the fact of um, seen so many personal histories just completely gone. Like somebody, and going along with the archives, someone would pass away, there wouldn't be a plan for anything to do with any of their stuff. It would get put out on the curb, the family wouldn't want it, and it would, so much history was destroyed through that. But mainly what, the way it affected me was I just, it changed me somehow to see that much history just gone. The thought somewhere that like, it's almost as if, um, you know, this person was just vanished. And I think that really pushed me to sort of chronicle stuff that maybe wasn't necessarily, um, you know, the, the court cases and the political gains, but maybe more of the social history that kind of slipped through the cracks. So that's really where I discovered my passion of history. But since I was a little kid, I was always fascinated of just looking through books of, um, especially I was obsessed with daguerreotypes. So it was, <laughs> so it was it's, it's been there, but it didn't have a focus, I guess is the best way to put it. Okay, thank you both so much for your answers. And thank you um, to everybody that has joined us tonight. Uh, just before we officially wrap up here, I just wanna give a little bit of a plug um, on behalf of the bookstore. We're uh, celebrating a milestone soon. Um, at the beginning of November, we will have our 40th, 40th anniversary celebration. Unabridged Bookstore has been a part of this community since 1980. And though we can't celebrate it like we normally would or the way that we would want to, um, we do want to say thank you to everybody that has been part of our history. Um, we're offering 10% off sales that weekend. We're debuting a new tote bag and some new bookmarks. Um, we're still limiting shopping in the store. So anybody that wants to continue to support us and help us celebrate, please order online, order by phone. If you do drop by, remember that we're still observing some health and safety guidelines. Um, 
And in light of that, remember that we're only here and have only been here for this long because of your support. So please buy this book, buy other books from us, help us stay here. Um, help say thanks to these authors and to Gerber Hart for the important work that they do. Um, and thank you to both of you for joining us and being part of this tonight. Thank you, Owen, for your thanks. conversation, for your questions. Um, thank you to Gerber Hart for helping host this and for, the, for making a, a home for our history. And thank you to John for your research, for writing this book um, and for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks. It's thank been a all. pleasure. Buy the book, read Queer Legacies. <laughs> <laughs> everybody have a good night. Thank you all. Thank okay. you everybody. Bye.